So my name is Peggy Chu. I teach in the History Department at Pomona College. Uh, I'm here with my colleague in the History Department, Angelina Chin. So today we have um, a panel of speakers uh, on, who will be speaking on the topic of citizen activism and nuclear industry. Uh, today's event is generously sponsored by the Pomona <laughs> Chemistry Department, Pomona History Department, EnviroLab Asia, and Old War Center. So thanks to all of our institutional sponsors. I'd like to briefly introduce uh, our four guests, um, starting uh, to my immediate right here, Dr. Allison Campbell. Uh, Dr. Campbell received her PhD in Physical Chemistry from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Uh, she was the 2017 President of the American Chemical Society. Um, she's this year's uh, Robbins Lecture uh, for the Pomona Chemistry Department. Uh, next to Dr. Campbell is Dr. Kate Brown. Dr. Brown received her PhD in history from the University of Washington. Uh, she's an award-winning author and historian, uh, and she's the Pomona History Department's 2019 Ina Thompson Lecture. Um, then we have Dr. Mon Kei Tom, who received his PhD in anthropology from the Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2018. Uh, his work focuses on citizens' capacity and self-empowering practices in order to forge translocal links and engage the Japanese state in critical assessment of the risks of radiation. Uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Caitlin Stronel, who works as a researcher with the Citizens Nuclear Information Center, a nonprofit organization based in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, Dr. Stronel completed her PhD in political studies at Joharlo Nehru University, New Delhi, in 2016. Um, so, uh, we're going to be posing a series of questions and inviting our speakers to respond. Um, from their experience and also in response to each other, and then eventually we'd like to open up uh, the floor to questions from the audience. So, let me get started. <coughs> Hello, everyone. So, I'll be asking uh, the questions, and then hopefully um, uh, you'll be inspired to ask more um, after my questions. So um, the question I have for the uh, speakers for today is, um, if you, um, it would be good if you could uh, describe your work and also give us an overview of your engagement with nuclear energy. Okay, so I'm going to start. Okay. Okay. So my engagement with nuclear. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, my engagement with uh, nuclear energy really began on March 11th, 2011, in earnest. I was kind of involved in various environmental movements before then, but after the Fukushima disaster, I was in Tokyo at the time, and so I experienced that in the aftermath. I was actually doing my PhD in India at the time, so when I went back to India, I changed my topic to uh, anti-nuclear movements in India. So I did my PhD on that, and then when I came back to Japan, I'm now working with uh, Citizens Nuclear Information Center, which, as uh, Pia mentioned, is, is a non-profit. Um, our engagement is really a citizen science type approach. We try to empower normal, regular citizens so that they can understand what uh, nuclear power is and whether what sort of choices to make about it instead of leaving it to experts to make all the choices we try to make it so that people have enough information to make their own choices so that's really my engagement so. okay. thank you um, I'm Matt K. Tam and um, I'm based in Hong Kong I'm not so sure my engagement with nuclear energy uh, because I, I, I kind of think I'm doing something disengaged with nuclear power because uh, my research is about um, the Fukushima nuclear disaster and the impact to the um, affected residents and then many farmers and therefore I'm not sure because I'm studying how they use their own technologies um, to do some um, cleanup and also monitoring of radiation after uh, uh, to the radiation released by the damage to re uh, reactors so I started my work from 2016. I followed um, returned farmers uh, from a village called Itate in Fukushima and studied their collaborations with citizens and also um, expert scientists to, to restart agriculture and livestock raising. Um, well, 
and then I um, I do my field work from 2016 until 2017, um, and I lived there for a couple of months uh, with them. And before I start my PhD, I was a Greenpeace campaigner. That's why I read all the reports about like how the disaster affects people's life, and they all said that um, Itete, the village, is not the it's not a place to return. But um, just like um, the ghost town um, in Chernobyl, but having lived with them, I discovered that there is there is there is a way, there is a possible way of living, and that's why my basically my research question is how can ordinary life become possible again in a radioactive landscape? Uh, my engagement with nuclear things, nuclear began. About, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe a little longer, when I started research, researching a book about the first two uh, plants and cities in the world to produce plutonium. And I just thought this was going to be a, a history about you know, the foundations of the nuclear security state, but I got more and more involved in questions of environmental uh, contamination of the territories around these plants. And also the health concerns that people were telling me about, who were farmers mostly, who lived downwind and downriver from the Mayak plutonium plant in the Russian Urals and the Hanford plutonium plant in eastern Washington. And you know, nuclear things, it's like, this was like, it was like taking a bath in a, in a pool of molasses. It really sticks to you. Uh, and it's hard to shake this topic. And so then I, I felt like I hadn't really gotten the story about, because these were military sites, about the health problems, and I thought there must be more evidence in other sites where there are nuclear spills that were in civilian sites. So I, I went to Kiev and I started uh, snooping around in the Ministry of Health archives for the Ukrainian Republic when it was part of the Soviet Union, and then I moved down to Belarus and to Russia. And I started, um, and have just finished, and will publish uh, next week a book about the Chernobyl disaster called Manual for Survival. Hi, I uh, am Allison Campbell, and uh, I am I said, a physical chemist. And uh, the way that I got engaged with things nuclear is that uh, after I got my degree in Buffalo, I took a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is in Richland, Washington, and that is right adjacent to the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, which is one of the Department of Energy's uh, nuclear sites. So there was the production of uh, fuel for nuclear weapons and then subsequent cleanup activities associated with that after weapons production ceased. Uh, I am not a nuclear chemist by training, um, but having lived in a community now for 30 plus, or almost 30 years, uh, and working with uh, colleagues who are, have dedicated their lives to trying to clean up uh, the Hanford site and other <coughs> DOE legacy sites and the challenges that are associated with that, I feel like I have a, a fairly good understanding of things nuclear. And I also have in-laws who uh, came to the Hanford site as early workers back in the day. And so I have anecdotes of, you know, in terms of what life was like back then and how people felt about the mission. And so I would say you know, it touches my, both my personal and my professional life in, in very different ways. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, what do you see are the main questions, problems, and challenges facing the nuclear industry? Okay, well, uh, I've divided these problems into, I, th I think there's a lot of problems. Um, and. The main one for me is uh, cost. I think that, you know, for most of our, my organization's life, we've been trying to tell the world that nuclear is unsafe, that nuclear is a violation of human rights in a lot of ways. There's ethical issues. But when it comes down to it, I think that probably the economic issues are going to be perhaps the ones that put a stop to nuclear in the end. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, we, so we need some really good uh, economists to, to show, um, do more, more work on this. 
Um, I think uh, starting up nuclear has become very, very difficult, and just recently uh, Japan has, because they realized they can't build any more uh, reactors in Japan after, after Fukushima, it's going to be very difficult for the public to accept that, which is another problem. Um, Japan has decided on an export policy, so they're trying to export their nuclear power plants, but that's just been disaster after disaster, really. First, Vietnam decided that they would uh, not do all of those deals with Japan. Recently, Turkey, uh, the Turkey, the Japan was also going to build a plant there, but because of cost, that is also not going ahead. And even more recently, in the UK. So I think it's going to be very difficult um, to get proper finance. Uh, and I think the other thing that this is also related is the waste disposal the, uh, factor, which nobody's really been able to figure out um, uh, after all these years. So I think that's also going to be uh, another major issue which, which the nuclear industry is going to have to, not just the industry, that uh, all of us are going to have to deal with. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I think I think one of the major issues of nuclear energy right now is we, have, we do not have a holistic picture of nuclear power. We, we, have, we have too much focus on power generation, but without um, without an understanding of the beginning, uranium mine, mining and the end, decommissioning, and also the treatment of uh, radioactive waste, and of course this disaster. So, well, let me tell you a story. Like, right after the Fukushima disaster, the um, Abo Australian Aborigines, um, they, found that, they found out that actually the, the radiation released from the crippling reactors was converted from the uranium <laughs> mine in the mountains. And then what did they do? They sent a letter to the UN Secretary saying that we are not going to do that anymore. Um, and then saying that they are sorry of that. So we simply lack this kind of like holistic understanding of nuclear energy. And yeah, and this th this is the first thing. And the second thing is, I think as an anthropologist of science, science and technology, I'll take nuclear power as kind of a product of late capitalism, late industrial capitalism. So under the conditions of this late industrial capitalism, Fukushima actually is just one of those ecological disasters um, that becomes normal and common since the 80s. Chernobyl is another example. Uh, Mopal in India caused by the Union Carbide and the Dow Chemicals is yet another example. <coughs> so, to me, the nuclear energy, in, some, in a sense, is it boils down the problem of nuclear energy is actually the problem of late industrial capitalism. And I think the accident actually offers us a, a short window of time to reflect on that, the, the social cultural processes and also the political arrangement that make that happen. Um, <coughs> I think, yeah, well, let's end here first. <laughs> um, yeah, seconding the cost and uh, the waste problem and the whole organic cycle. Um, I'd like to have us consider today that you know, Roy Scranton um, predicts that in order to solve the climate change crisis, we're going to have to have 12,000 new nuclear reactors on this planet, and they have to be built within the next five to ten years. And so, hard to think about. That's, you know, a nuclear plant or two next to every big major metropolitan area, and as we've seen, the public is sort of okay with nuclear power until it's real close. When it's close by, it's not so okay. And having studied um, both uh, you know, nuclear disasters in, in terms of intentional spills at the plutonium plants and accidental spills at Chernobyl, what I find is that very quickly, humans lose track of this radioactivity. And it, and it, gets, um, it concentrates in, in food sources and goes up the food chain and to the super predator at the top of the food chain, which are human beings. And um, even when there was a small uh, accident in 1987 in Brazil, a thousand curies were spilled. Four people died, 200 people were hospitalized, and a half dozen villages had to be wiped off and moved away. 
That's just a thousand curies. We're talking in Chernobyl from 50 to 200 million curies. Uh, at Hanford, they, they think there's about 350 million curies uh, that were ejected from the plant, and the same with the Maya plant. So we're talking about a lot, but we don't really have a way of keeping track of this radioactivity. Yeah, I think I'll echo what's been said. I think uh, to build a new power plant in today's environment is incredibly costly. Um, it's technologically feasible, but it's incredibly costly. And then uh, the licensing that goes with that is costly, not only financially, but in terms of time. And these things have a finite lifetime, they don't run forever. So you, you know, if you're going to rely on nuclear power, you got to think about beyond 40 years when you built this next group and make sure you can afford the investment that you're planning to make today. I also, uh, and, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of strain on uh, all nations' budgets, and this would be another type of strain. All right, thank you. Uh, the other uh, is, I think we have to, I think we, from a scientific perspective, understand how to dispose of the waste. The challenge is more of a political slash policy one as to what to do with it. Uh, it's right now sitting out either on in casts on the commercial plant's land being stored until we can, uh, from policy, at least in the United States, from a policy or political perspective, decide uh, what the long-term storage solution is. We're still sitting in um, in uh, ponds, spent, spent fuel ponds, and that's personally what worries me a little bit is because whenever water is around, that's your transport medium for the transport of waste, which is uh, because of the water in the area, not because of the material itself, but it gets out and the water is a wonderful solvent for these things and takes it to where you don't want it to go. I also think that even if all of that aside, we can handle all of that, uh, Caitlin was saying earlier over lunch uh, about education and perception, and we have to have people in our societies who understand what it means to have power plants and nuclear power so that they can make ed educated choices for themselves and not leave, I mean, we said it earlier, not leave it to the experts uh, so people can feel, uh, feel empowered. And so I think the nuclear industry has to do a better job, even if it wasn't expensive and we knew how to deal with the waste uh, of educating people about the pros and cons of such a um, power stream. So I'm going to ask you guys to switch to order uh, this time around. <laughs> um, so uh, all of you have mentioned costs and uh, waste disposal being the big problems for uh, the nuclear industry. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, since this panel is about uh, citizens' uh, activism, um, and I wonder um, to what extent do you think the public, uh, whether in Japan, the US, or elsewhere, is informed about the use of nuclear energy and also the um, questions and um, challenges that you have talked about. Okay, I'll do the reverse. Um, well, I, I just mentioned I think that we need to do a better job of informing the, the public about all of the issues that surround it. Um, Perhaps you could also talk about how, like, mm, how, how do you think like the, the scientists could let the public know more about uh, these issues? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I've been here all week as part of a, a lecture series in the chemistry department, and one of the things that I tried to stress to the students is whether you're talking about nuclear power or something else, uh, it's really important that we as scientists demystify science in general and perhaps demystify uh, nuclear science uh, more specifically. And I think that uh, it falls upon us in the, in the scientific community to take that first step and help people understand what the science bases are for decisions, what's known and what's not known, uh, where we have more, more clarity and more certainty, and where we have less clarity and understanding. And because science is it's, it's an evolving thing, we're constantly learning new things. And, um, and I think uh, we as scientists do, in general, a poor job talking to the community about our science in terms that the general population can understand and relate to, whether it's nuclear power, the use of chemicals uh, in, our, in our society, or, you know, um, uh, 
you know, anything else. And so I think uh, that is the responsibility of, of, of all of the scientists is to reach out and, and, and educate uh, the individual population to demystify what's going on in the laboratories and, and the understanding and the discoveries that are occurring. Uh, yeah, it, I think as somebody in the humanities, um, I think we perhaps have a role to play in this too. Um, a lot of times scientists don't know, um, you know, the, the history of the studies that they cite as fact. You know, they don't know the political parameters and the limitations of those studies until a historian goes through and, and, and digs up, you know, kicks up all that dust. Um, same thing, you know, science has a tendency to want to, like in a laboratory, narrow things down to sort of monocausal factors. So, uh, you know, people living around Hanford, for instance, there's a really high rate of um, uh, neurotube um, birth defects. Those are, that's spinal bifida and, and anencephalic babies are being born at six times higher rates than anywhere else in the world other than in northern England near the Sellafield plant, which was used to make plutonium for Great Britain. So, you know, when scientists look at that, they say, well, <clears throat> there's not enough, you know, radioactivity leaving the plant right now to affect these mothers. Um, there's not enough nitrates, so there's, you know, there's not enough pesticides. But rarely are these things put together. Um, we have layers of radioactivity, you know, northern England, they have radioactivity from bomb fall fallout in the 1950s and 60s, from the wind scale accident in 1957, from Chernobyl in 1986. Uh, how do we, you know, and, and everybody just looks at, you know, this one source and says, well, there's not enough radioactivity, but what about all the layers taken together? So I think people in the humanities can remind scientists, um, they already know about the complexities, but, but about the need to take those complexities into account when the work is being done. Um, change a little bit context from the United States to Fukushima to Japan. And I think after the Fukushima disaster, there is always a contestation between the general public um, and the state in terms of how to interpret the, the science, the, the risk of radiation and uncertainties um, that it entails. So, for example, um, the Japanese government always wants to use the use maps and other visualization tools such as the monitoring posts or even the wearable oximeters to kind of give people a sense of security and safety, saying that at that level you are okay. But on the other hand, the citizens after the um, disaster, they, they do not trust the government anymore and they start doing their own science, like doing their own maps, um, and also doing their own measurement of, the, uh, of their bodily exposure. So in, 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 in this sense, if um, in the 50s and 60s, um, there is a kind of secrecy in the nuclear science, um, actually after the Fukushima disaster, there is, it is a, an exercise of democratization of nuclear science that's happening among the general public within the one, two years after the disaster. And I think this is, all, this is a good trend, but on the other hand, when maps become fixed, like it also gives a false sense of say, security to people. Like if you are outside the zone, then you are safe. But as, but as Kate just said, actually the radiation unleash release, you can trace that, where, where they have been going. So going back to my own research, I'll say, we cannot just rely on um, the, the scientists, the official scientists, on demystifying the nuclear myth, but also the citizen scientists <coughs> actually can do something very politically engaged. They can also do something transformative and also scientifically articulated. Okay, well, I'm just going to echo really uh, what MK's just mentioned about um, public awareness of nuclear energy in Japan, which really totally changed after Fukushima, because before that, most Japanese were completely in favor of nuclear power. They thought it was a great way for their resource poor nation to generate all the electricity it needed to become the world's second most biggest economic power. 
um, and everyone thought it was great. But as soon as Fukushima exploded, there was, um, <coughs> as MK just mentioned, a huge, it was like a betrayal. These people had believed all of those things that the scientists told them, and all of those things that the government told them. It, some people even compared it really to sort of Japan after the Second World War, the betrayal, the fact that they believed that they could win, and then it ended in such a disaster. That kind of betrayal, I think, uh, was a very big factor in people saying, okay, well, we can't leave it to them anymore. We really have to do this ourselves. And um, that trend has, has been... Uh, it was very strong, of course, after the accident, and mothers were like, well, what are we supposed to feed our children? And so, in fact, citizens set up entire testing stations with huge pieces of state-of-the-art machinery that they got from donations because people were so worried, and they so didn't believe the government that they just had to do it themselves. And it was really about what you were feeding your children. It was really uh, sort of a matter of life and death. So um, that really, uh, I think, changed people's perception and also people's understanding and also people's um, willingness to find out themselves and to, you know, make the, the big uh, decisions, uh, not relying on people. This kind of, I don't know, it's maybe uh, in the US people have maybe less trust of the government, but the Japanese have a huge trust of the government most of the time. They tend to just rely on experts quite readily. Um, they're, they're called okami, those above, who we just, uh, it's fine, we, we were very happy to be told what to do. But this, so this was really a very radical moment for Japan. Um, and I think if, you know, the Japanese can really get excited about um, studying, not excited is not the word, uh, can, can feel that it's necessary to um, challenge experts and to do the science themselves, then that's really um, a big sign. So since you're talking about uh, how Fukushima has changed the uh, public awareness in Japan, so I'm wondering how um, other nuclear accidents like uh, Chernobyl or the Three Mile Island uh, have also changed perhaps the public perce uh, the public perceptions in the um, in, in in Russia or in Ukraine or the the U.S. And uh, maybe you could uh, talk about that and also. Um, uh, if you could say uh, something about how your work is playing a role in broadening uh, this conversation or raising this awareness, um, that would be great. I got the microphone now. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I think uh, if, you go, if you go back in time, you see to a surprising extent, um, really since the beginning of the nuclear age, there have been protests against the nuclear age. So the very first protesters uh, were the scientists who made the Manhattan Project bombs. They immediately said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we, we don't necessarily need to drop this on the Japanese, we could just have a demonstration. Right. You know, and then, and then you know, um, Oppenheimer himself, you know, got into big trouble and lost his security clearance and was thrown out of the Manhattan Project for opposing the hydrogen bomb. You know, th this, this atom bomb is powerful enough. We don't need to go stronger. Um, so these protests have been going on very quickly. By 1953, people in Utah, near the Nevada test site, which opened in 1951, noticed that their sheep were getting sick, their kids were getting sick, that they themselves didn't feel well, that people around them were dropping from leukemia and throat cancers, and thyroid cancers, and they started to protest starting in 1953, and those protests went along a pace. I think if you, you know, when you look back at the history, you see one of the motivations for civilian reactors in this country and to export them around the world to places like Japan from the United States was to try to turn people to have the peaceful atom, have an atom that was good and constructive, not the martial atom that destroyed things. Um, and that worked for a while. I think the 60s were relatively calm until Three Mile Island. Um, and then after Three Mile Island, seven years later, there was Chernobyl. And then there were, after Chernobyl, there were all kinds of um, declassification of Cold War um, records about the nuclear legacy from producing nuclear weapons around the world and testing them. And so I don't think we've really have had many moments when we have 
as a, as a populace, been happy about our sort of nuclear girdle that has surrounded the planet since 1945? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I agree with all of that. I mean, and, you know, Einstein beforehand was very concerned about, um, the, you know, the, the bad things that could happen from splitting of the atom. And so, um, I mean, certainly when you have an accident of any kind, it changes perception. People realize that things that perhaps they had taken for granted or didn't fully understand, uh, they need to understand more about, or they shouldn't take them quite for, for granted. And, it, you know, and so I think uh, you tend to get these uh, awakenings that happen when people see um, an accident occur. I also think, though, um, maybe a bit of a contrarian view is that, uh, you know, we have, when, when things are going well, in, in our community, we have a, a commercial nuclear power plant. And it's had its troubles. You mentioned, you mentioned it over lunch time today. Uh, it's called the, it's called today the Energy Northwest Plant, but it, it was the Washington Public Power Supply Company, or whoops, because they had <laughs> No, I'm serious, it's the, that's what I, talk about bad branding. <laughs> and yet, even with that, uh, I would say the community in which I live in is very forgiving about things, because Maybe they think they're more educated or uh, have a better perception of the, the plus side of what can happen with nuclear energy. Many of them were involved in the Hanford site and have maybe a little bit deep, deeper understanding of what can be gained and a deeper understanding of what can happen and go wrong. Um, and so I think, you know, accident shape of any kind, shape people's uh, it helps them understand what they don't know or what they perhaps have taken for, for granted. And I think this is where education comes in into play because we have to understand our accidents. We have to understand the actions of others, whether they were well intended or not, and learn from them. And then if we're an educated populace, we can make the right decision for us at the right time and the, and, and the right decision for our community. And so, um, you know, I think it's a given that an accident of any kind will, will shape thinking. Whether that's long-term or short-term, I think just depends on is it one accident or a series of accidents that occur. And in this case, we've had a series over the last 30, I guess, 30 plus years, 40 years, I guess now. Um, and so, uh, again, it comes to me as a scientist, to, I get asked a lot about these things when they occur. And, it, and my job is not to judge my job is to help people understand the science that exists, the state of that science, and help them make their own opinions and assumptions about whether they want to have nuclear energy or uh, those types of things in their, in their backyard. Yeah, well, as I said earlier, I think I take the nuclear power as the product of the late industrial capitalism. So whenever accident happen, it over us a short window of time to rethink the like the social and cultural processes and also the political arrangement that make that happen, and then we can further to find ways of alternative. For example, like shortly after Fukushima in Japan, people start like for example take more public transport. They stop buying cars. They try casual wear to work, and the and the shopping malls turn off the lights. They close earlier, and then this this kind of act actually let Tokyo, um, um, they can survive without nuclear power for more than a year. So this is something that I think a disaster can offer in terms of like creativity, if you can use the word. But on the other hand, I think accident also create po polarization of opinion. So like the other day I, I, the other day I was asked a question whether Fukushima produce is food is safe or not. I was so tempted to say that Fukushima's food is the safest food in the world right now. But if I accept that, I would be classified or being blamed as supporting government propaganda. So the accident actually polarized the public opinion into two very end 
there is only anti-nuclear or pro-nuclear. But is that it? Um, so I think the, the current debate or discussion has to kind of not just staying on some sort of matter of facts and step up a little bit on like matter of concern and then to, if we can, put the, all those um, alternative ways of living into perspective, it can, it can actually continue to, 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 to let us all to think about, um, to, to become like, um, to talk about questions related to the matter of care, not just staying on the factual side. Yeah, I would agree completely that it's um, also about um, yeah, the concern for for people who for their mental state as well as as well as like just scientific facts. Um, I uh, well, as I mentioned before, obviously the Fukushima d disaster changed my life. I mean, I changed my whole PhD topic, and so I think it, it on various levels it really can. Um, uh, and, and everyone's life in Japan changed to some degree. I think. Um, the, I think Alison mentioned that in the short term and the long term, and now we're up to eight years after Fukushima, and it's interesting to see um, what has happened after that. And I think there has been like a large awareness raising, and it hasn't, it's gone down a little bit. You can't sort of maintain your rage and your interest maybe for, for over long periods. But um, I think that one of the things we have to be careful of is that we see in Japan now, um, and in fact MK just mentioned it, you know, if you say the food's safe, then you're kind of on the government side. The government has this massive campaign at the moment to try and convince everyone that there's no problem, we're having the Olympics, it's all fine, and eat the food and, you know, it's, it'll, there won't be a problem. And what, what started the problem in the first place, what they call the safety myth, that Japanese nuclear reactors are never going to have an accident. It's kind of, you can see it being rehashed in uh, various ways. So we have to, and in fact, I agree that in fact the Fukushima produce is so tested. In fact, probably the, the surrounding um, prefectures where it's not so tested, where maybe the radiation has leaked, it's not like they stopped at the border of Fukushima and Tochigi prefecture, for example. So maybe that food is, you know, there's so many there's so many grey zones, and we really have to uh, be aware of them as well. And yeah, my, my concern, I think, at the moment is is um, the, the legacy of, of Fukushima, that we really have to keep up the, the education, we have to keep up the vigilance, and that's a big challenge for, for us as well as, a, as an MPO. <coughs> So um, I'm going to ask the last question. I've been holding on to the mic for a long time, so I will give you guys a chance to ask questions after that. Um, so um, uh, I think this question is uh, uh, responding to some of your um, answers and also to um, uh, Dr. Brown's uh, lecture on Wednesday, that if we see um, these events as accidents, then um, uh, people tend to, uh, you know, be uh, very concerned for a period of time, and then they tend to forget afterwards. So uh, perhaps we need to see it as acceleration rather than accidents. So, uh, and then we know that uh, uh, currently not only are there nuclear power plants in operation, but there are also plans to build more nuclear plants, such as in China. Um, and then in Japan, there are um, uh, they, uh, there are uh, nuclear plants being restarted. So what future um, for nuclear energy do you see? And also, um, what uh, we as, um, as, uh, as individual citizens can do um, to, um, to create a better future? India and China is the biggest uh, nuclear power uh, advocates uh, right now. And um, there is, of of course, there is an energy policy saying that they are phasing, phasing out uh, coal-fired power plants as well and replace them with both renew renewables and nuclear. But, you know, like in China, central government policy and local execution could be very different. And this is the first thing. The second thing is um, the, the access of information is definitely a problem because um, nuclear power is not an energy question but a state security question, national security question. 
So it's very difficult to get information access, and um, <coughs> public uh, decision making is there is no public discussion on where to build the power plant. And once it is built and up and running, you don't have information, not much uh, operation data is released. So even to Hong Kong. So I think if we talk about a future, we have to take care of also like China, India, um, and, 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 and other upcoming um, <laughs> countries. They are, they are so eager to build new nuclear power plants. Like a, a lot of countries, countries in Africa and also like in Asia, like Vietnam, Cambodia, or even Mongolia and Bangladesh. Yeah, and Russia. Russia is a big nuclear power, and they've they've created recently um, a city right there in St. Petersburg in the harbor, floating reactors. So you can just tow it over to Dubai and plug it in, and, and there you go. You know, this reactor has been um, put online since Fukushima. Um, so I, historians are, you know, as a historian, I, I don't know anything about the future. But I can tell you about the present, and I, I think what's happening in the present is we're, and, and maybe in the near future, we're going to get a full, we're getting a full court press um, selling the next generation of, of nuclear power plants. And, and we're going to hear words that we've heard in the past. They're perfectly safe, there's very little waste, and we've got these, these issues all buttoned up. Um, and there's some big, you know, there's some big guns, um, important opinion makers and very wealthy men, um, uh, Bill Gates. Jeff Bezos, uh, are, they're, they're, try, they're putting money towards their own brand of fusion reactors, they're hoping to cash in in the, in the future. So I think as a, a populist, we have to ask the questions that maybe we failed to ask 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, we have to maybe get involved a little bit more closely in what exactly these new fusion re reactors will um, deliver to us as a society. I agree. I, don't, I mean, I don't think any of us have a crystal ball. My, my, my sense is that in the United States, anyway, nuclear power, is its, its future is a TBD. And it may be driven more by cost than, than anything else, which is, you know, a reality. Um, I think regardless of how you feel about it, whether you're pro-nuclear power or against nuclear power, the more education you get about it, the more you understand the history of where it came from and the... Uh, accidents that have occurred, how we've learned or not learned from what the activities that have occurred in the, in the past to help us move forward uh, is important. I think any time you have an electorate and a people who are well educated and versed in a topic and, and, and then have a voice with those that are decision makers, we're better off as a society. And so I think we have to look back in order to figure out what's best for us going forward. I don't know what the future of nuclear power is in this country. I think it's probably an uphill battle at this point for those that are in favor of it. Um, and I also think as a scientist, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, the science around other renewables, or uh, not other renewables, renewables uh, was just woefully uh, um, lagging. Now we're, we're doing things that offer alternatives. And so we should explore those as well and get smart on those. I just think education and knowledge and understanding where we were to where we want to go is really critical. Okay, um, yeah, I think that the future's uh, pretty bleak on, as I mentioned right at the beginning, the cost factor. And uh, I just think in terms of pure economics, nuclear power is, is just not going to have a very smooth road. Um, but I think um, uh, MK was mentioning um, that there's a lot of countries who are, uh, well not a lot, but there's quite a significant few countries that are breaking into nuclear power and who really want to build reactors. Um, and I'm thinking of Turkey because recently, as I mentioned, the, the Japanese uh, conglomerate uh, led by Hitachi, uh, decided, uh, no, no, Mitsubishi, it was there, decided not to build. Um, but at the same time, there's a Russian uh, project at Aku in, in Turkey, which is going ahead. So 
and that'll be Turkey's first nuclear reactor. Bangladesh is also with Russian cooperation, uh, building one as we speak. So, and it's a huge cost, and Russia's offered very good um, terms, you're interest-free, you know, it's like, uh, you know, there's, it's, it, they're making it easy for these countries to, to, to build uh, financially, but it's going to be such a huge cost to countries which maybe uh, don't have, you know, a lot of money. And I always, I was speaking to my Turkish friend the other day, why is Turkey building this? And we look at countries like Saudi Arabia, and we, we mustn't forget the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And um, I think that's also an issue that you know we really have to think about in terms of the future.